All right, we're now backstage at the historic Whiskey A Go Go with Michael Graves. How are you today? I'm well. Good to see you. I know you've got an album and a tour to promote, and we'd love to sit in the spirit of Halloween here. Yes. <laughs> Let's go back. I know you grew up in New Jersey, New York area. Yeah. Who were some of your heroes? Who inspired you to want to do music and get in this crazy business? Um, I've been using examples like Freddie Mercury, uh, David Bowie. Yeah. Um, you know, anybody that I came across as, as a young man, music always had such a profound effect on me. I would yeah. listen to it and I would have a, I would have a physical reaction to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when I was younger, I, I again, I, I, I I love Bruce Springsteen. You know, I came up, I was old enough in the 80s to remember the, you know, the, the, the big rock era in the 80s. And um, so, you know, I, I look to to, uh, to all the, the popular artists yeah. for inspiration. But a lot of those innovative 70s guys like Bowie or Queen, they were really pushing the envelope theatrically or... Right. You know, right, and then so when they when the eighties creeped in, you had you know you saw bands like Poison and Motley Crue, and even Guns N' Roses in the beginning, they had a, a bit of theatrics to them. You know, they looked like they were from a different planet. I remember yeah. one of the I remember seeing the um, Ozzy Osbourne video when he did Bark at the Moon. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it was and he was the and he was the, the werewolf. werewolf. And I just I, I loved it. I was a theater kid, so that always yeah. Remember, there was a scene shot in the dark or something. He's on a billboard here on Sunset Boulevard or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many stories in this area. Yeah, well, yeah. obviously, you know, of of that era, you know, you had bands like the Ramones and all that kicking up out of New York and you know making a noise, creating the punk scene and the uh, new wave, whatever you want to call it. The alternative had become, you know, like a mainstream, you know, type thing. Um, tell us how you met. You know Jerry and became, you know, involved with the Misfits. How did all that come about? I was at the right place at the right time. I was working in, um, you know, a small band in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and we were recording a demo. And it just so happens that I picked a studio in Lodi, New Jersey, called Real Platinum Studios, owned by Bobby Alec and Bobby and Jerry and Doyle. Um, we're we're working together on a project, same studio that. Um, you know, Glenn used to work out of and record stuff all the time. Um, and I was, I was cutting vocal tracks and, and Bobby was sitting there with me one day and just said, there's this band called The Misfits, I'm working with them. You seem to have a lot of talent, why don't you give them a call and see if you can aud audition for them. It might be good for you. So I called up Jerry and um, he said, learn as much as you can. And when you feel ready, give me a call and you come down and sing. It was as easy as that. The yeah. night before my, my 20th birthday, I, I was the first time I went down and jammed with them. And how many songs did you learn? I learned all of Walk Among Us. I knew most of Earth AD. I knew just about everything off of um, Collection One. I, I knew as much as yeah. I could. I wanted to go in there and knock it out of the park, okay. and I did. So they were obviously impressed with your, your not only your ability, but your dedication to... Yeah, the yeah, they, they knew I, the first time, Doyle wasn't there the first time. It was mm -hmm. me, Jerry, and it was Chud. And I could tell that I impressed them. Mm -hmm. I could tell. And then, you know, I just, I kept coming back. And the situation escalated, you know, because they were, they were, I don't want to say frantically searching, but when I first got there, Dave Vanian from The Dam was supposed to come back. I always heard about they were still trying to get Glenn. They were always looking somewhere else, and I was always the guy that was just, you know, I came and and um, and I would rehearse with them. You know, I was like the, you know, like the stunt quarterback mm -hmm. as they were as they were looking. Um, there were weeks that Doyle and I eventually, um, you know, they took out an ad in the in, in the newspaper and. Everybody from all over the place showed up. All over the place. There were people flying in because word got out that Jerry was recording everything and he would give you a tape after you were done. So everybody wanted to come and sing with the Misfits and get recorded. So <laughs> um, 
I, I, I sat with Doyle for weeks and, and, and people would call. We, they decided, right, let's start screening people. <laughs> and so you would call this phone number and Doyle would be on the other end of the line and I would sit with him in an office and we would do it all day long and just talk to people on the phone and, and hash it out. But eventually, this story goes where it was Halloween and Halloween was approaching and the Misfits had to make a move or they were going to have to wait a whole another year for them to come out because the Misfits have to relaunch on Halloween. So um, Ken Creedy and Typo, who was representing Typo Negative got in touch with the guys and said, why don't you guys come out and do something during our encore set at Roseland in New York City on Halloween night. They said, great, we'll, we'll, we'd love to do that, but we don't have a singer. Can, will Pete Steele do it? So Pete gets back to them and says, absolutely, I'll do it, but I don't know any of the songs. So everybody calls me and asks me to go teach Pete Steele these songs. I'm a huge, I was a huge Typo Negative, huge Typo Negative fan. So of course, I was, uh, I was delighted to do so. We went to Brooklyn, we started uh, rehearsing the songs, we got about halfway through the rehearsal and Pete stopped everything and he said, this is, this is crazy, this is your singer, you gotta let this kid um, get up there and, and do his thing. He sings mm. it better than me and anybody else in this room, this is your guy. Wow. So you could tell that it was a natural for you, and it was kind of a uh, push for him to strain to do it. Sure, and he knew how hard I was working, and 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 he 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 knew the backstory a bit, and yeah, those those guys knew. Well, it's a nice story. Like I say, the the, the guy was right under their their nose, and it took somebody from the outside they respected to kind of yep. push it push it mm -hmm. over the hill. That's great. Well, I know you ended up doing you know seven. Several releases with them with American Psycho and Scream and Famous Monsters and Monster Mash and all that. What, what were the highlights for you? What, what do you look back the most fondly on? Getting to mix with, with the bands that we toured with and, and the relationships mm -hmm. that we created and the, and the push and pull and the competitiveness of the bands and, you know, whether it was Anthrax or, or Life of Agony. Um, I, I, I really loved having um, the experiences that, that I had with, the, with all the amazing, amazing artists that, um, that I got to know a little bit and work mm -hmm. with and be on the road with, whether it was Marilyn Manson again or Megadeth or the guys from Guar. And so, yeah, it's just been an amazing, amazing journey. Yeah, it's such a community among the musicians as they say it's a very small world everybody's connected to yeah every yeah. other band you yeah know? we were doing a lot of touring and and um the camaraderie and and the way that we were all pushing each other because there was such a fire in our bellies to 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 make it as they say in the business so it was just a really really great time that's beautiful now i know from there again you uh you had projects of your own and everything but you end up uh you know, same with Marky Ramon, mm -hmm. you know, doing the Ramones thing. So, mm -hmm. two of, you know, the great, you know, alternative bands, you know, Misfits mm -hmm. and Into the Ramones. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, it's a, it was a tribute in a sense because, Definitely. you know, sure. obviously the, the boys had passed or, uh, you know, Marky was doing his own thing. But, you know, what was that like and, you know, what did you learn from those songs? Because those songs just never die. For me, it was it, it was a blessing because I remember obviously I remember when all those guys were alive. I remember mm -hmm. when they retired. You know, we mm -hmm. we were all from the same area, so we yeah. were always mixing together. You know, we were always running into each other or jamming with each other. Um, and obviously, Ramones were one of the greatest rock, you know, punk rock bands yeah. ever. Um, so it was an honor for me to to be singing those songs that that those guys wrote. Um, but for me, it, to be able to have known those guys the way that, that I did, and, and again, to mix with them a bit, and to hear the stories from Marky Ramon and, and the other people that I got to meet through that experience, um, just hearing the stories back then, you know, we did, and to, and to understand the, the emotional aspect of it, the backstories of some of it, um, was an, was an incredible experience as well, and it um, it helped me honor those guys. I felt mm -hmm. good to be able to wave that flag and talk about punk rock, 
Yeah. Um, and as well show my talent. Um, um, but yeah, but again, just an, an amazing experience for yeah, me. It's great. Great legacy, and speaking of the Whiskey A Go-Go, I know this historic Ramon shows when they first came out from New York right yeah. here, you know? Yeah. It's where it all started. I, I, I don't know what other word other than, than, than blessed I, I feel, again, to mm -hmm. be able to stand on a stage like the Whiskey A Go-Go and know the legacy of this place, and you know, this is like a church. It's, yeah. it's truly sacred ground. What well, truly is, you know, and for rock and roll to survive, you know, we need the uh, we need the support. We need people to, you know, um, not only bless the stage but continue to bring, mm -hmm. you know, innovation and mm -hmm. forward thinking, you know. Yeah, and to I, these hallowed halls. I, I hope that I'm I'm leading yeah. that charge or part of that the, the tip of that spear. Absolutely. We'll talk about that because I know, uh, obviously, with your latest album. When worlds collide, you know you're taking that energy to the next level and continuing to develop your your songwriting. What do you uh, feel that you best accomplished? You know, with the material on this record. I think that I've best accomplished again more of a focus on um, communicating my worldview and my life and my life experience and encapsulating that in in, in in song, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And how about the track, you know, Dying on a Sunday Morning, I know that's in a sense a uh, sequel? Yes. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, my, my, my business partner uh, who, who produced the record with me, um, I, I always knew that I, that I wanted to and was uh, write a song that was like crying on Saturday night, but I was always afraid to go there because crying on Saturday night is such a It's such a great song and it's it's you know, it's beloved by the fans The fans love that song It really really resonates with them and I didn't want to do something that seemed contrived and Just like you know, oh let me write a song like crying on Saturday night because that's what the fans like um but my business partner just called me up one day as I was working on the record and it was more of like a, you know, it was more of a creative challenge. Um, I said, why don't you, you know, you're in a good headspace right now. It seems like you might be able to nail this. Why don't you write the sequel to Crying on Saturday Night or the continuation of that, like that thought, uh, you know, that the allegories and the things that I was trying to push through Crying on Saturday Night, why don't you continue that? Um, and my response to him was, no way. There was no way I'm doing that. Um, you know, but he gave me confidence. And then that and thought was you just didn't want to tarnish what you already had. Right. It's kind of jumping the shark because if, if the song sucks, it's going to be like, oh, I don't know. He was just trying to mm -hmm. capitalize on, right on crying on Saturday night. Um, but that, that song really, again, I think it, it resonates with the fans and they get it and, and it, it feels good in them. So... I successfully jumped the shark, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, what else can you tell us about this tour, you know, that you're on? Beginning of the end, you know, I know, again, you are you got a full catalog to, to yeah. pick from. Yep. You know, tell, tell us about what this tour is all about for you and where you go from here. Well, this tour, again, we're, we're playing a, a fine uh, mix of, of, of the Misfit songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gotham Road songs, you know, a, a nice mix of everything through my career. We're, um, we're working hard on, on bringing the, the theatrics back. I'm in full makeup. I got full costume on. Um, my body is, is healthy and in shape. And, and so uh, what I bring to the stage is, is nonstop power from beginning to end. Um, I'm being innovative as I can on stage. Um, and I'm really trying to raise the bar and the optics on, on the kind of performer that I am and want to be, um, as well as the band as a whole and the music that I'm making. That's great. Now, all that you've seen over the years and gone through, what are some of those, you know, those tips that you can kind of pass on to the next generation? I know the, the business is constantly evolving. Sure. But as far as that mind state, that perseverance, dedication it takes. Yeah. In a way, it seems like it's 
it's harder than ever, you know, to stand out of the pack. So it's true. You know, and a lot of these younger kids expect to be able to click a mouse and be at the goal line. So that's true. You know, what do you that's what do you true. tell them as far as the marathon that it takes just to have a shot? I think that it has to start again in your heart and in your mm. soul. I think that you have to have you have to understand what you're doing it for. And and for me to dictate what that answer is 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 not up to me. I know what I'm doing this for. I know where I find my my grace and my strength and my fuel. And that's in the the connection that I have with my fans and mm -hmm. um and that love that we share. I spend a lot of time I go out of my way to look in as many people's eyes as I can and hold their hand and hug mm -hmm. them and 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 just have moments with mm -hmm. with them. That's what fills my spirit and and fuels my my fire you know and the creative part of it and again the the um how i strive to be more excellent than than anybody else and really like i said like freddie mercury like you know yeah. david bowie these these stars Trail that shine years. so bright in their creativity and and so I, and, they, I, and they were fearless it's a, yeah. a lot of it's about taking risks because yeah, you know, it's so easy to follow, but these guys went out on right. a limb. Absolutely, know? absolutely. Marilyn Manson comes to mind. Alice Cooper, um, and so I, I think that as well as that, there needs to be an intellectual component to the scene and, and, and to music as well. And any young artists I, I work with or I talk to, I always tell them that there has to be an intellectual component that will bleed into every aspect of, of our art, culture, music, entertainment. Um, you have to develop your brain. You have to understand um, the world best you can. You have to read and get your head, especially now out of your smartphone and just, and just you know, uh, ingesting all of this static and, and focus your mind. It's, a, it's an incredible time to be alive and nobody should be bored and there's plenty of things to sink your teeth into. And I think that if you, if you filter everything through that um, and you keep your mind and your body and your soul healthy, I think that that's how, you, that's how you'll shine in the sky. Absolutely, and, and with so, so many independent tools these days, you don't need to yes. sit there and wait for a record deal. Or, right. A right. record label to do something for you, you know. Right. If anything, companies are only going to come if the ball's already rolling anyway. Sure, sure. So, you know. It's not like it was when these companies no, were flush you know, with cash. Waited for just, a deal and there's a record store in every corner and all that. Now it's a different era. You can go direct to the yeah. public. Yeah, and nowadays as well, you have to work doubly hard at, at what you're doing because the 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 entrance to, to all this is, again, with social media and everything else, it's anybody can get into it, anybody can get involved. Yeah. Well, Michael, always a pleasure. Can't wait to see you bring the walls down, whiskey tonight, celebrating Halloween weekend. What a yes, special time. indeed. We'll see you on the next road. Thank you.